East Idaho Newsmakers is brought to you by the Bank of Commerce, your bank of a lifetime. This is East Idaho Newsmakers with Nate Eaton. Welcome to East Idaho Newsmakers. This week we are happy to have Dr. Fahim Rahim in our studio with us. You probably know him. He is very involved in the community, not only with medical work, but also charitable work. Dr. Rahim, thanks for coming in today. Well, thanks for having me, Nate. I want to get right, right to kind of the beginnings of how you ended up in East Idaho and, and your background. It was a very long tunnel. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so I was born in Pakistan, which is the northern part uh, of Pakistan. Um, and then I grew up in the south in a city called Karachi, which is now, I believe, the third or the fourth largest, most populated city in the world. Population is hitting about 24 million people. So I went to medical school there, <clears throat> and then I moved to New York. Um, and did the rest of my training in nephrology and medicine there and then decided to move out back into the mountains. So I'm here in Idaho for about 14 years now. 14 years. Why Idaho? You know, when I finished my training, <clears throat> like I said, I wanted to first get away from the crowds and I like the outdoors. I race mountain bikes. I do a lot of outdoor stuff. So Idaho was perfect personally, but professionally also I wanted to go somewhere where I was needed. You know, my street in New York had more kidney doctors than the whole state of Idaho when I moved out here. There were about six here. And we had like 15 in my neighborhood in New York. So I wanted to go somewhere where I can serve and help out. So when I moved out in eastern Idaho, we were the first board certified nephrologists in eastern Idaho. Because before us, people had to either drive to Boise or to Salt Lake City to get care for transplants, for kidneys, and things like that. So it, it worked out really well. For and all so of us. your specialty is kidneys, <clears throat> renal. Right, so we do take care of people with chronic kidney disease. Um, like I was telling somebody earlier, we also take care of most of the transplants between kidneys and liver and pancreas because there's not a whole lot of uh, physicians who deal with complicated uh, diseases out here, so yeah. So you moved to Idaho. You're one of the few doctors you were saying before we started that is independent on your own, not attached to any specific hospital. Right, so we serve um, all the communities. So we go to Pocatello, Blackwood, and Idaho Falls. We serve out of all hospitals in the region, um, and we are, we are independent, we work for ourselves. But well, I tell people I work for my patients, you know, not for any corporate, that's my, <laughs> my new fight, so yeah. How do you get started when you move to a brand new community and you're on your own? I guess if you're the only doctor providing the service, you're gonna automatically have patients. Well, not only that, it was a, it was a, it was a fight, because you know, you had to change the culture. People were not used to um, um, specific need of, because you have to identify the need and tell people there is a need which hasn't been served, right? I mean, people get used to it. So the referring physicians, I still remember the first week when we moved to Idaho, my brother and I were renting a small apartment next to each other in Pocatello, and we start, you know, uh, calling a list of physicians in the whole region. That we had two brothers, we moved from New York, we were originally from Pakistan, so you know, it takes time for them to really, Pakistan and Pocatello, and what's your last name again? So you know, we went through all of that process to create, but I think we created um, our, our, um, our base just by providing good work and doing what we like best, which is taking care of our patients. That's about it. So you're based in Pocatello, but you also work in Idaho Falls. Well, I live in Pocatello. I'm based in all three communities. So we have a full-time office in Idaho Falls, and now we are four nephrologists, and one of them is Dr. Hadley, who lives here in, in Idaho Falls. And we added a fourth physician a few years ago. So between the four kidney doctors, we serve Pocatello, Blackfoot, Idaho Falls, but our catchment area is actually much wider than that. We, we cover about 300,000 lights, from Afton, Wyoming, down to Malad and as far west as Burley, so patients from all those communities come to our clinics for, for care. 300,000? Roughly about 300,000 people. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so <coughs> the big thing that you're doing now, which is, is pretty impressive, is this one-stop shop, I guess you could call right. it, for medical care in <coughs> Idaho Falls. Tell us about that. So there, there are a couple of layers to that. Um, and you know, most of us don't really understand what's, uh, what's happened in healthcare over the last five years and what's on the horizon. So, and I'll walk you through a couple of scenarios. Let's say, Nate, you are a family of four, okay? Or just it's a hypothetical situation. And you don't get any health insurance from your employer, but you need health insurance because federal government now mandates you, because if you're not gonna get health insurance, you're gonna get fined. You make enough that you don't qualify for federal subsidies or anything else, so you gotta go on an exchange. So one of the problems that has happened through Affordable Care Act, or what we call Obamacare, is that 
we have really narrowed down our choices. So when you enter or go to the website of Exchange in Idaho, living in, in a specific county, you put your zip code in, you're only given three choices. And those choices are going down by the years. There was a time when you had three or four choices. Now we are, you know, if you were living in Banner County in Pocatello, and the situation down there is worse than in Idaho Falls is, you're only given one choice, okay? Now you, you gotta have an insurance, you only have one choice, so you're stuck, okay? You have signed up for that insurance. Now all of a sudden you realize, once you sign up for that insurance, the physician you used to see for the last 15, 20 years is not part of it. The hospital you used to go and see where all your kids were born is not part of it. So it's a very deliberate effort to divert traffic to specific places. So basically what I'm telling you is, Corporate healthcare in America is taking away choices and options from physicians and from patients. So how do we fight that? Well, we fight it by two ways. We fight it by creating more choices and options which are vested in the community, by reducing the cost, by doing a better job, and by improving the quality of outcomes, okay? So this um, idea that you're talking about one-stop shop is not new. It was started by, you know, Mayo Brothers who were one of the pioneers in this more than 100 years ago and created Mayo Clinic. And I was in Rochester, Minnesota a few, few months ago because I was called in to give a talk there. And it's, you know, it's an amazing facility in the middle of nowhere. Okay, Rochester is surrounded by cornfields. Okay, in Idaho we still have more <laughs> around us. So you go there and you enter a building and you have all these specialist physicians who are just in one place taking care of complicated chronic diseases from all over the world, okay? How do they do that? They interact with each other. They provide a very coordinated and integrated care in a very low cost outpatient environment, okay? So I tell people, they're not geniuses. You know, we have really smart physicians in Idaho, okay? The problem is we don't talk to each other, okay? Communication in healthcare is one of the biggest challenges. So, the project that you're referring to, which um, started as an as a integration of cardiology, which is heart and kidneys, has now expanded to an integrated care clinics where we now have 15 physicians, at least in the project and out of walls, from orthopedics and heart and kidneys and pain and family medicine, all in one place. So the patient goes into one building, they get their lab drawn, they get their prescriptions picked up from the pharmacy, physical therapy is right there. The heart doctor and the kidney doctor see them together for complicated problems. Their family doctor is right there, you know. So it's, it's an environment where a very low cost outpatient but integrated care is provided. And that's the future of healthcare. So that's kind of what we are creating in Out of Falls, but I'm, you know, this will be replicated in the, in the whole region. I would imagine it would have to be because, as you <clears throat> said, it's really not new. The Mayo Clinic's been doing it. Oh, yeah, but Cleveland but on a local done. level, how many times do you go to the doctor and then you're sent to the specialist and then you're sent here and here? I mean, you're, you're visiting 12 different doctors. Why, why hasn't this been done earlier? Well, a couple of reasons. First is, like you said, you know, it starts from a vision. It starts from leadership. When you're only working for one hospital or one provider, then you're limited in what you can do as a physician, okay? Um, the other reason is that capitalistic healthcare environment, like I said, is changing so fast that they don't want these kind of low cost options available because they're doing very well, okay? If you, if you talk about Idaho, we have pretty much one big insurance company now, okay? And without taking any names, I'll call it the blue sky of Idaho, okay? And if you have that and you have one big hospital in a community and they both decide they're gonna be really good friends to each other, guess what? These innovations will not be created because they would like to serve each other, okay? That's so, the bottom line. So could we say you're taking on the, the giant in a way? I am, I am. And I'm gonna have a really big target on my back for doing it, you know? But it needs to be done because that's the right thing to do. And, and you, while you may have a target by the industry, mm -hmm. I know patients that will, the, the, the response on the other end is going to be overwhelming, I imagine. You know, it's, it's going to be great. It's, it's going to be great. And we've seen that across the region. You know, patients will stand up for what's, what they want, but they will only stand up if they are given the options and choices. So I'm going to fight very hard to bring those options both on the insurance side and also on the provider side. You know, that's what American Dream is all about. You know, I came to this country for the options I was available to be given to scale my opportunities, you know, and, and we will not let that change, so yeah.
So you moved to Idaho, you start your practice. At what point did you think, you know, I think I need to do something more here. I think, I think we should come up with this clinic. When did you decide to get the ball rolling? So this kind of vision started three or four years ago um, when I realized, like you mentioned earlier, it takes so long for patients to really get treated for complicated disease processes. They see the family doctor who identifies one problem, he sends it to the heart doctor who does something, then something else changes, then they gotta get into the kidney doctor. An average trip like this can take six months for a patient, okay? It, it takes a while and that adds to the cost it adds to the frustration of the patients, and you're not getting anywhere, okay? And let alone the communication. When was the last time a physician picks up the phone and says, you know what, Nate, I saw your patient today, this is what we're gonna do, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't happen like that, we are all busy. In these clinics, and we started our first project in Blackfoot about six months ago, um, and the heart doctor and myself were seeing patients together, him and I sit down like this, patient sits down like that, and we are talking to each other and the patient and we come up within 15, 20 minutes, a perfect plan that we work together on, bless you. So that's the vision, but it's not something new. It's not something rocket science. It's something very simple that needed to be done. You mentioned uh, the Affordable Care Act earlier. There's a lot of people that can't afford health care or, uh, you know, don't think they need it because they, they're healthy and they haven't been to the doctor in 20 years or whatever. What can fix health care? I would imagine this clinic idea could be one step in the right direction, but, but overall, what needs to happen in your opinion to, to fix this? You know, um, sadly, we've, uh, over the last few years or, or longer than that, we have really created a myth about health care that is very difficult to fix. It's not, okay? The simplest answer to your question is transparency, okay? If we create transparency of cost structure and access to those um, places of care, then you will see how things will, will improve. A very simple example is, I'll give you, a, I, I give this example all the time. Um, you go to a grocery store, okay? You gotta buy a gallon of milk. You're not paying for it, let's say a third party, your insurance company is paying for it, okay? Now the grocery store knows that you don't know the cost of this and somebody else is gonna pay for it. So they're gonna say, you know what, Nate, we're gonna sell it for $15 a gallon, okay? You can pay two bucks, the rest will be covered by somebody else, okay? Now when that structure happens, when you're not aware of the true cost and somebody else is creating the cost structure for you, then they take power away from the consumer. When you connect the consumer directly to the provider and take, get rid of the middleman and create a transparent cost structure, then you know what you're getting for what you, what's worth. So when you go to the physician's office and you say, Doc, I'm gonna see you, how much is it gonna cost me for taking care of me? He says, you know what, there's gonna be X amount because even I know what it's gonna be because now I'm getting the cost structure too. So that's the biggest problem. When was the last time you went walked in the hospital and they said, you know what, These, this is the list of services we're gonna provide, this is the cost, and this is the quality. So you gotta be transparent on cost and quality in the whole region. And only then we will walk in the right direction. We have to deliver open markets. We cannot go for a one-payer system because that will create monopoly. And we see it already, okay, whether it's the government or whether it's a third-party healthcare system. So transparency of cost and outcomes are the key. You gotta go to a doctor or a hospital who will say, we do a better job and this is how we can compare ourselves to the rest of the nation. This is how we compare ourselves to the rest of the nation in terms of cost. I mean, a friend of mine recently sent me a message that you know he went and got a gallbladder taken out for his wife. He paid $26,000, I mean, the, his bill was $26,000, his outpatient cost was 4,000. Now, the question is, does it actually cost $26,000 to take a gallbladder out? You would know better than I would. No, you can put a transplant. You know, so, so it doesn't. <laughs> Get a kidney for that, yeah. yeah. But when you as a consumer is not aware of the cost structure and the quality of that service, then you're blindsided. And somebody else is paying for it, but you are also got outpatient costs attached to it, right? So I, I, think, I think transparency of cost and quality will be the key. My three-year-old son broke his wrist, a tiny break. We went to the emergency room. 
my wife and I played the guessing game of how much do you think this is going to cost. And then we went to the specialist and um, we got the bill and it was coded as surgery. It said surgery on the bill. But they didn't do any surgery. They, they, put on, they didn't even put on a hard cast. It was a, it was a, a, a splint or whatever. So we called and said, this is coded as a surgery for $4,000. They said, well, that's just the code that the insurance company asks us to use. A wrist, a broken wrist on a three-year-old boy ended up costing $6,000. You know, we asked the same question. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. I recently interviewed all four CEOs of all four hospitals in the region. First time in the history of Idaho, there are four answering same questions. Wow. And we asked them the same thing. He said, when the bill comes to the patient, why is it said a Tylenol, and he, one of the CEOs of the hospital said, yeah, the Tylenol will be labeled as $60 a pill. And we asked him why, and guess what his answer was? It's funny money, okay? It's funny money. It's funny money. Well, it's not real, but it's there. But the problem is now you're creating a perception that the Tylenol will cost 60 bucks. Yeah, the insurance company is gonna pay you maybe $5. But when somebody who has no insurance comes your way, and you're gonna show the same cost structure to that person, how will he fight you from $60 of Tylenol down to five bucks? Because he doesn't have the resources or the contracts that you have in the insurance company. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems in healthcare, and greed is the biggest one of them. And doesn't that prevent the people that really need it that, that say, I just can't afford it because I don't want to pay $60 for a Tylenol. The people that need it, they don't want to go in because of this. No. So, so going back to the gallon of milk, you know, and you can argue that, gosh, 40 million Americans don't have health care. That means 40 million people cannot afford to buy that gallon of milk. So we're not going to try to make that gallon of milk cheaper, like three bucks, so everybody can afford it. But we're going to create smart ideas so we can give access to everybody, so everybody's now paying $15 milk for a gallon of milk through subsidies and tax ideas and other things. But now you're jacking up the cost for everyone. Why don't you try to bring the cost of a gallon of milk down versus trying to say now everybody is now supposed to pay $15? If you're not gonna pay 15 bucks a gallon of the milk, I'm gonna find you. So you don't have a choice. But let me give you an exchange. And on exchange, you only can go to one grocery store that you got to drive 20 miles away. You can't go to your mom and pop shop across the street, which can provide you a service as well. So, so, it's, it's, so, so you see what I'm saying? There's, there's so much colluding and so much problems that's happening in healthcare. So where do you start? Where do you start to tackle that? Well, you start right here, what we are doing. We have to uh, educate the, the communities of what they're facing. I mean, I'll give you a simple example. Right now in Pocatello market, the, there's a crisis. The largest insurance company for the state of Idaho, which probably has 80% of the market, is working with the largest hospital in the community. And the idea is the hospital has to work to keep other insurance companies out of the market. And the insurance company is gonna work to keep other providers out of the market and create something called narrow network in the name of quality and cost which means they're gonna take away the choices away from you as a patient and from me as a doctor if I don't agree to what they want me to do, okay? This happened in Idaho Falls market and a couple of years ago when the problem was really, really bad and it's softening up a little bit, one hospital created a narrow, narrow, work, net, narrow network and excluded other hospital and providers and so that is the issue. Now, the, the solutions are these, community awareness. People have to be educated in very simple terms like you and I are doing today, what the problems are. The second thing is, and you're going to laugh at this, uh, and I'm going to say this as a Republican, okay, on record, I'm not a big fan of President Trump, okay, based on moral morality, okay, he's not a good role model for my family or my kids as a human being. But if there's one thing that he's going to do right, and he's able to pull that off, is to fix some problems in Affordable Care Act, which we all call Obamacare, okay? One of the reasons why we're seeing what we're seeing today is one of the, one of the elements in Obamacare was to limit us geographically. So when they build these exchanges, so Nate, let's say you're living in Bonneville County and I'm living in Bannock County, when I go to that exchange, I'm limited geographically in terms of options of insurances. So Blue Cross of, or let's say Blue Sky of Utah cannot come into Idaho to sell their product, okay? 
So they created these state boundaries we cannot cross. The problem is when you live in a state with only two or three million people, you are left with very little choices because insurance companies cost structure and product is based on the number of people they serve. The more number of people, millions of people, they can spread their risk across, the cost goes down. So if you live in a state with 50 million people or 10 million people, your cost structure will go down because now you spread the risk across 10 million people. But if you only have two or three million people, your cost goes up because the risk is high, right? So when we limit insurance companies from crossing state lines and creating more products for other people, then we end up creating monopolies. So one of the things that uh, President Trump is trying to do in fighting this uh, uh, Obamacare is to dissolve those state lines. So a product from Utah you can buy as in health insurance, okay? Or from Wyoming or Montana or California. And I think that will be a big win as a consumer, both for you and for doctors, okay? Um, so I think that is one of the other parts of the solution since you asked me what are the solutions that can happen. So this is going to be a tough fight, okay, because there's, like you and I don't have the kind of lobbying power that big hospitals and insurance companies have. So it's going to be a tough fight, but who knows? We'll see. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have more with Dr. Fahim Rahim. At the Bank of Commerce, we understand the hard work, determination, and sacrifice it takes to run a successful business. That's why we're here every step of the way to help make your dreams come true. The Bank of Commerce, your bank of a lifetime. Welcome back to East Idaho Newsmakers. Today we are visiting with Dr. Fahim Rahim, who is, I guess we could say, changing medical care in East Idaho, especially once this <clears throat> clinic goes up. Well, yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> You've been in practice for uh, 14 years here in East Idaho. What would you say are a few things people watching right now are doing to their bodies that maybe aren't so good? Oh, where should I start? You know, I, I think better lifestyle choices is the key. Um, uh, United States is becoming one of the most unhealthy nations in the world uh, because of our uh, choices that we make. And the choices we make are also depends on the choices that are available to us, right? So if you go just on 17th Street and you want to eat healthy, okay, let's say you want to go on a lunch break, you want to say, you know what, I just want to pick up some bananas and some fresh fruit. Let me drive through somewhere and see if I can do that. Gosh, no way. You'll be able to pick up a bag of fries for $2, but you're not going to be able to find a drive through or and a Coke, but you're not going to be able to find um, a banana and an orange uh, through any drive through okay? And even if you decide you're going to go to a grocery store, walk in there, you're going to pay some premium money just to buy one banana and orange. First of all, they're not going to sell you that too, right? So I, I think it's, a, it's also a complicated issue. Um, but I think if we demand um, for healthier choices and options, I think that will be the key. So obviously, the, in simple terms, you know, we have to choose a healthy diet and we have to make sure we exercise and, and burn those calories. So you were, you were born and raised in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are, the, what are some differences? I, I have never been to Pakistan. I don't think a lot of people in our audience have. What we hear about Pakistan as terrorists mm -hmm. and uh, Muslims and people that might live in huts, and I hate to say that, it'd be yeah. stereotypical, but that, that's our knowledge. What, what are some things that are different about Idaho or, or similar that, that you found between your home country? You know, that, that's a great question, Nate, and, and, and as you can imagine, I've been asked that question so many times. So what I did last year, actually earlier this year, um, roughly in, in early summer, was I took a friend of mine from Idaho Falls, born and raised in Rigby, and a friend from Pocatello, born and raised in Pocatello. And I took them to Pakistan with me, okay? Um, to really see firsthand, because I can sit here and say all I want, okay? But till you experience it, you, you really don't know. The most beautiful thing that came out of that narrative was when we, they landed in Pakistan and they went through the northern areas with me and we hiked uh, and met with the local people who have never obviously met an American too, for most part. What we realized, end of the day, we are all human beings. We all crave the same thing, which is take care of our families, have um, enough to feed our kids, have a safe and secure living. Okay, obviously, their you know their demands and their needs are way different than ours. Um, the narrative changes completely, um, and and you know when they came back, and that's what they've been talking about. You know, they obviously the scenery was a little different. You know, the mountains where we went were average twenty thousand feet or higher. 
okay, the world's second tallest mountain is in that range. Um, but the interaction of the people, even despite the communication barrier, really disclose that what we see and hear on the media is not really the truth. So what I tell in summary to people is, sadly, the, the information on the media around us, the narrative makes us believe there's a lot of evil in the world. But the truth is that there's a lot more goodness in the world than there's evil. So we're doing a really interesting thing out of that trip. We are, we are, we are making a small 30 minute documentary and, and it's got some amazingly powerful narrative. So when is the documentary expected to be out? You know, we are still working on the editing. I, I didn't realize what it takes to edit. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but, but it's a beautiful documentary. It's called Hashtag I'm Human uh, and, and mostly led by, by an amazing young man out of Ida Falls, um, Roger uh, Sander. And um, so I'll, I'll send it to you. What's next for you? I, I think next uh, on the horizon is to obviously finish the project in Ida Falls. Um, um, that will be a very exciting project. Um, and then replicate the same model um, in Pocatello, which is badly needed, because um, Pocatello has a lot fewer options than even in Ida Falls does. And do you foresee the day where when people need a transplant or a serious operation that it can be done here rather than going to Salt Lake City? Yes, I do. And, and that's something that we are also working on. As you know, uh, my brother and I work very closely with Idaho State University and President Vale is for the last 10 years to help bring the medical school. Obviously, we are not the only ones. There are many people who are involved in that. We are now working with um, Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center in, in the HCA um, and very closely, and we, which I'm very proud of, the initiative by them, which is to bring the residency program for internal medicine. So we're going to train 10 physicians in this community every year uh, in internal medicine, which will be a great asset for our community. So it takes time to build those infrastructures. So we're working towards that infrastructure, and eventually I want to bring training in nephrology, which is the kidneys. And then down the road, the idea is also, we've had these discussions with them already, to do at least kidney transplant um, in, our, in, in our communities. And if you're able to pull that off, you will be the first in the state of Idaho to do that. So yeah, these are big goals, but you know, you gotta start somewhere, but we are definitely plotting the seeds for that. So when you're not working, what, what do you do? Um, when I'm not working, I actually race mountain bikes. So I train throughout the year um, for racing um, mountain bikes and road bikes. That's kind of my passion. That keeps me sane. That's the only time when I'm on a bike and I'm not thinking anything can, else yeah, except escape. for just yeah. focusing. So yeah, that's kind of what I do. Um, I'm also getting into mountaineering. I have some plans to climb some big mountains in the next two years um, and training towards that and some ice climbing. And so some, that's the beauty of living out here. There's a lot of options for outdoor stuff that you can do. Well, we're lucky to have you here in East Idaho, and um, thank you for coming in. The Dr. Fahim Rahim, we're going to continue to follow his projects. Of course, we did a story that we'll link to a few weeks ago about your clinics in Idaho Falls and, and what's next. And uh, thank you for coming in here, and thank you for watching. Have a good week. East Idaho Newsmakers is brought to you by the Bank of Commerce, your bank of a lifetime.